perfect. Well, thank you guys all. You all look very comfortable in this uh, beautiful innovation zone that we've got today. And I have two very incredible speakers uh, with me today. I have Suzanne Kearns joining us from Waterloo, Canada, and Mr. Michael Maltano, CEO and President of Embraer Executive Jets. And today, obviously, we're discussing uh, young professionals and the changing face of business aviation. And that's both from a consumer standpoint and also a professional talent and uh, group and type pipeline. And you know, we've, we've got some great speakers today and you guys were at the key, keynote this morning with Ed Bowen. One of the consistent themes that we continue to hear uh, in this industry is, is change and innovation because as we all know, change is the only constant we have in life. And business aviation in the past um, was typically limited uh, before it's maybe a smaller community of, of larger companies and now we seem to be experiencing uh, significant segmentation within the market. And, and so Michael, with Embraer's done some pretty exciting things and you guys had just some great news announcements actually the other day. Uh, before we get rolling, can you tell us a little more about your news that you guys just had? Uh, thanks Chris, and uh, great to be here. I, I think it's very exciting to take a look at the opportunity that we have sitting in this view and all the young talent that's here. So thank you for coming out and enjoying the afternoon with us. Uh, we announced two great products and we're very excited about disrupting the industry. Uh, we have a little bit of a philosophy of being different by design and disruptive by choice. And that stems from 50 years. Next year we'll have a jubilee, a 50 year anniversary of Embraer of innovation. And innovation is at a heart of a lot of what the young talent is seeking in an aerospace company. And these products, which are called Praters, Praters means leading the way. So if you're understanding, like, why'd you call them Praters? It's the concept of being first. It's the con concept of being out in front. It's the concept of being leading the way. And we're leading the way with both the Prater 500, Chris, and the Prater 600. The Prater 500 is the mid-size cabin class aircraft, and the Prater 600 is the super mid-size. And these combine technology, comfort, and performance features that are going to be ahead of every other aircraft that sits in that space. And that's the kind of innovation that we're trying to be at the leading edge of when it comes to Embraer. No, that's, that's incredible when the, the innovation, again, that, that same consistent theme we keep hearing. So in, in your position at Embraer, um, you, you've had the chance to witness this industry evolve over, the, over a number of years. What shifts have you specifically recognized in the consumer base and why you guys develop the products you do? Yeah, it's a great question. So if you look back into the 1960s, you had uh, airlines that uh, clearly were connecting on both global and regional basis. And then when you look at what transformed from that was charter operation. And then from charter operation, you start to look at the corporate flight departments that were forming, aircraft management companies that were forming, and customers that were supporting uh, that infrastructure. And then it was the wake of the fractional marketplace in the late 80s, early 90s that was very innovational then and still to this day. And as the, these decades continue to, to, to grow, you see the consumers that are accessing business travel also changing. And you went from the baby boomer marketplace where you had uh, large companies that had the pinnacle of wealth acquiring aircraft to where you started to see the premium passenger model start to deform and develop. And that's what we've seen with the online booking platforms, the uh, other models with the jet cards and subscription models that are out there with all the companies that you see here at the MBAA. And the customers and the consumers are changing and why they're changing is because they're no longer focused on the asset called the airplane. They're focused on the experience and what you can have by having the connect point of air travel through the airplane. So that's why technology is important for the consumer. That's why comfort is important. And most of the social demographics have changed. So you see a lot younger wealth, both in the employment base of the companies that are in the aerospace industry, as well as those that purchase aircraft. And you, you had high net worth individuals uh, coming into the marketplace, a lot of young uh, wealth being created. And what used to be a, a 50 crowd and up buying airplanes has quickly become a 40 year old and up crowd and even younger wealth coming into the marketplace. So we have to adapt to the uh, consumer uh, looking for what's interesting to them. And for us, we believe that it's focusing on value and focusing on the customer's experience while being on an Embraer airplane. That's interesting you mentioned the, the customer experience and the, the value, because it's maybe not features, it's, it's the value or the benefit to them. 
Why has that been a big focus and a shift for Embraer? Yeah, so when you, when you recognize that uh, you have a competitive landscape and you have a lot of high quality products from a lot of great companies across the, the sector, uh, aerospace is a growing marketplace. We happen to sit on the very competitive space coast of Florida. So there's a lot of com competition for jobs and a lot of competitions for customers. So you have to constantly innovate. And as I mentioned earlier about the 50 years that Embraer has done that, we're always looking for not what's expected, but what's unexpected. Mm -hmm. And uh, the announcements we made here at the show is a good example of what was unexpected because uh, I, I don't believe many saw it coming. And, uh, and how we do that is hiring quality people and bringing them into the organization and being a part of the Embraer family at a very early age. Uh, we have relationships with uh, local high schools. Um, Ugali High School, just as an example right there, local to our Melbourne area, where we're having uh, associations with those high schools and doing programs that will bring them in, like STEM programs, curriculum that our, our HR department's working with uh, them. We have talent pools that allows us to attract uh, the employees to the company. So I think you have to start with bringing people uh, with fresh ideas. The average age of Embraer's employees, okay, now think about this, 50-year-old company next year, and the average age is 32. So that gives you some framework of you have to bring in fresh talent. We also, also recently launched our Embraer Business Innovation Center, which is in Melbourne, and has reframed it as an entire company called Embraer X. And that's another example of trying to look for digital uh, solutions and transformational solutions that are very disruptive and very innovative. So the company is always trying to reinvent itself and be on the leading edge by bringing in uh, young talent into the organization, both domestically here in the United States, but it all started in uh, Brazil. And we have a Embraer Institute and Embraer Foundation and that's helping the uh, inner city communities in Brazil that are not as fortunate as all of us here in good old America, but we bring back that infra uh, infrastructure and allow them to have a, a career path in aerospace or in defense or in uh, executive business management. So we try to do things at the grassroots, Chris, and I think that's critical to building the f companies for the future and the products and services that support that future. Yeah, that, that's really, really interesting how you guys have been able to adapt to that changing landscape. So I commend you guys for doing that. Uh, now, Suzanne, you've got, you're on more of the institutional side. And, and with your work with NGAP, can you uh, enlighten us and share with some specific initiatives um, that are currently being worked on and, and how business aviation can be a part of that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you as well for, for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm sure like many of you, it's just an amazing event. The scale of, of what's happening here is remarkable. Um, so NGAP, for anybody who doesn't know, is an initiative with ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, NGAP stands for the Next Generation of Aviation Professionals. So back in 2009, it started at ICAO with some volunteers from universities and industry groups. Um, it kind of like it, it grew slowly over time. Uh, and then in 2016, the assembly, so all of the world that participates in aviation, uh, met at ICAO and they uh, upgraded NGAP to an official program status and at the same time they designated that attracting, recruiting and educating the next generation of aviation professionals is a global priority. Now this is crucially important because what they were really looking at is that the existing training capacity on a global scale does not meet the projected demand for the industry. So it's, it's a remarkable thing to be in an industry where there's such tremendous growth. And when I'm uh, teaching young people, of course, it's a really exciting time for these young people because in the past, it wasn't always the case where the passion and the opportunity align. I think all of us have been in aviation for a while knows that sometimes uh, that isn't the case. And, and so it's a remarkable time for young people. But the reality is for the existing industry, it presents a tremendous challenge. Because we used to be able to be comfortable in saying, uh, we're an attractive industry, students want to be in our industry. Uh, it wasn't sort of um, putting responsibility on us to go out and recruit and promote and outreach and educate. And that has really shifted. 
um, in, in a lot of different ways. And so a few different initiatives. Uh, I, I work, um, so I'm vice chair of the NGAP program at ICAO. Um, but last year, we uh, developed a free online course it's called Fundamentals of the Air Transport System. Anybody can check it out. It's, it's online for free. Uh, and the goal is to, on a global scale, to get some fundamental introductory aviation education out there in an accessible way. Um, and the way that that course works is that people who want to can pay $100, they write the exam, and they earn a certificate. So if you want to be professional, uh, you earn a certificate. But what that allows is a sustainable model so that the few people who are willing to, to pay are allowing us to fund it for everybody else who can't pay. Um, and so we have to be a little bit creative, I think, as far as how we're arranging output. Um, so the ICAO program, we look at um, recruiting everybody from young children, so like kindergarten age, uh, all the way up to post-secondary adults who are maybe transitioning into aviation from a different career. Uh, we look at sort of educating, um, attracting them into aviation, um, and creating pathways and pipelines into the industry. Uh, I can tell you I teach uh, classrooms of, of 100 eager young pilots uh, on a weekly basis, and the challenge that they have above all, we did a survey and we said, what is the most challenging part of the program? And more challenging than the flight training, than the classroom experience, or any of the academic requirements was the cost. Uh, and I know um, in America that that is a challenge as well, that there's been a lot of growth as far as industry partnerships to provide funding to help flight students with the cost of training. Uh, in Canada, it's still a, a major challenge. So a few initiatives that I would really encourage everybody in business aviation to think about would be what you can do to reach out to the next generation, as many of the great initiatives that your organization is doing. Uh, but every little bit helps. Uh, I can tell you in my class, my class assignment is that the students have to go out in pairs to the local community, and they have to make a presentation to school children talking about aviation careers. It's really simple. It doesn't cost anything. But these passionate people are going out, and they're spreading the word. Uh, and I think that's something that we all need to start taking responsibility for, because the future success of our industry is going to be linked to our ability to bring in talent. Suzanne you re reminds me, Chris, uh, you know, the, the engagement uh, of the process. It's not, that outreach has to be there. So we do a lot of apprenticeships, which allows us to engage in the curriculum at, uh, to develop the program. Uh, we, we do that with the National Aviation Academy. We do that in the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, it's just some examples. And then you bring them into the plant. So then they come see the production line. They see the engineers doing the job. They see the software programmers. So they have the opportunity of not just uh, doing the work in the classroom, but they have the opportunity to come to see the facilities and see the jobs they're seeking to be their opportunity from the curriculum that they're working on. So that apprenticeship program is a good way of doing that outreach. That, that's a perfect segue yeah. into a quick point. Um, can you guys help me? So can you raise your hand if you've heard the term competency-based training or evidence-based training? Yeah, so just another quick thing as, as an issue, building exactly on, on what you've just mentioned as far as making education practical. Um, so as well, uh, a few years back, um, some of the work at ICAO was looking at how we train and license pilots and was saying that the reality is an hours-based methodology of licensing pilots doesn't make sense. Like everybody sort of understands the idea that some hours can change your life and other hours are kind of the same hour you've experienced hundreds of times before. So not every hour is of equal value. Uh, I can say to you that uh, when I, I went to Embry-Riddle, I'm a proud alumni, and when I graduated, um, someone that I know, uh, her dad was an airline pilot and they owned a twin. And so she went back, lived with her parents, and uh, flew the twin engine around in the practice area until she had enough hours to apply for an airline. And everybody gets the concept that those aren't equal to somebody who went out in multiple types of operations, multiple weather conditions, multiple airports. Everybody understands that those two pieces of experience aren't equal, and yet our industry has historically equated that ours are all the same. And, and so just a, a challenge to all of you is that if you think about um, how we educate people, that competency-based training or evidence-based training means the same thing, uh, that it's fundamentally, instead of just looking at the knowledge, skill, and attitude that we need people to learn, we're looking at the practice as well, it, occupation as well. So everything is contextualized. The knowledge you need, the skills you need, and the attitude are specific to a job. Uh, and the reason why I think that's crucially important for business aviators is because we need to think about these young people coming through the ranks. Are we teaching them to be business 
those aviators? Do they have the skill set they need? Do they have the exposure uh, that they need to make the connections? Because historically, traditionally, uh, education, of course, it's hours based. And there's room there to innovate in, in different ways. We can talk more about that after. Uh, but I think the, the link here is that how much exposure are students getting to the world of business aviation during the educational process? And that if we want to encourage them, that's going to, of course, be something that's going to be and dependent on all of us. It's interesting, out. Susan, because you know, that reminds me that at the end of the day, you also have to hire. Right, so those programs and that outreach and that curriculum and that engagement and that intent-based uh, uh, opportunity has to come with hiring. And so just as an example, this year, uh, just in our Melbourne campus uh, for, for the United States program for executive jets, 691 people have been hired across the company in various roles and responsibilities. 5% of them are new graduates. So we're actually sort of walking the talk of making sure that not only are we doing the outreach in the programs, but we're actually hiring the people into the roles and responsibilities that are going to form the future of Embraer. No, I, I like that you mentioned competency-based training um, because, like, from the military, uh, my deployment in Afghanistan to get qualified as a pilot in command. I mean, I, I had just over 500 hours, and because of demonstrating proficiency in the maneuvers and understanding the mission and, and having the attitude and the mindset that you mentioned, I was signed off to fly some pretty ridiculous missions. So I, I think that is something of policy wise that I, I kind of want you to address here. So obviously with the shortage of qualified personnel, both from the pilot and the technician side and, and every other non-technical job in between, your work in the international policy, um, where do you see how things were in the past? and, and how things can be different going forward and what policies should be put in place or changed, amended, however you want to word it, that we have a healthy industry going forward. Yeah. So uh, competency-based training is not perfect and it's not replacing everything we already do. So it's taking everything that's good that already exists but it's making it more practical, more scenario-based, and more case-based. So, so, so I'd like to say that almost everything we do in a flight simulator, in an aircraft, a lot of that really is mission-oriented. It's mission-specific already. But if you think about the hours that are conducted in a classroom, so ground-based training, that for most pilots, you'll study air law, and then meteorology, and then maybe general knowledge, and then you have a test on each one. And I often say to people, I say, well, um, when you're flying, is that how you fly? Like, do you think about navigation? And then, okay, now I'm going to stop, and now I'm going to think about you know, regulations, now I'm going to stop, and I'm going to think about something else. Everybody says, well, no, of course. That's not how the real world works. And I was like, well, why do we teach it that way? And, and the uh, students are like, what? <laughs> what do you mean that that's maybe not the most optimal way of teaching? Uh, and the reality is that um, the way we teach it that way is because it's easier to teach it that way. It's easier for teachers. That way back in history, there was maybe an expert instructor, and they got to the point where they couldn't teach everyone, and so they have to write down curriculum. And then they give that curriculum to another teacher, and another teacher delivers that curriculum. So the curriculum becomes the standard for education. But over time, it's like, uh, you know, it keeps getting removed and removed and removed from the real practice. And so um, competency-based education is about doing everything we do already, but it's in a whole task scenario, it's problem-based learning, it's practical in nature. So you still have to learn everything, but in addition to learning it, you're applying that skill set and you're integrating it. Because the research shows us that the more segregated content is taught, the longer it takes people in the real world to put those pieces back together again. And so that's where you get improvements in efficiency. So one of the hallmarks of competency-based training is that it's individual. So whatever your weaknesses are, that's where you're focusing your time and your practice. Uh, whatever you've mastered, you skip ahead. So anybody who's done training and you say, like, I have four more hours left of night flying I have to do, but I feel like I've mastered this already, it's not efficient. Um, and so I would never advocate for the reduction of pilot proficiency. That's yeah. not what we're doing. But there is a process for recognizing where there's some redundant actions that, that maybe are hours you don't need to spend, you're not benefiting from, mm -hmm. and then using those hours in another way that actually helps you improve your skill set. So, so all of that needs a regulatory structure that supports it. Um, and also, there's tra traditionally advanced credit for simulation. Because, uh -huh. uh, and that helps a lot of things, the environmental aspects as well. Um, so there's a lot of benefit. But until there's a regulatory structure that supports the implementation of that, uh, of course, it's a big challenge. Uh, that being said, internationally, it's very standard. So everywhere else in the world is shifting towards competency-based models. We see that with cadet programs, with the multi-crew pilot license, with a, a variety of different initiatives around the world. Yeah, so it's, it sounds like there, there's been a, a, almost a cultural shift, you know, that's affecting the regulatory policies. And, and Michael, you mentioned all of the programs that you've got going on that are absolutely amazing to attract and retain and engage 
you know, employees and that younger demographic. Can you maybe let the audience know and explain what the company culture is like at Embraer? Uh, absolutely. So it's a family, and, and, and it started with the original founders of, uh, that, that, that uh, were here at Brazil and Embraer. The, the DNA of the company, uh, and that's how we refer to it, is the DNA of the company is very much about an engineering-based culture, a data-based culture uh, at, at its root. And now it has had to morph over the 50 years of its existence to take on uh, what's relevant to the employee base and the product base and the customer base that we serve. And we serve a variety of customers because we have a commercial aircraft business, we have an executive jet business, we have a defense and security business, and we have a, a, a services businesses that supports all our customers within those platforms for business units. And then on top of that, the recent launch of the Embraer X product um, and all of the digital transformation that it has. So we are very dynamic in terms of the broad base of the company. And because of that, you have to have a culture that allows it to be adapt. Um, and some of the comments that Suzanne have in regards to the learning process has to continue into the workplace. So we have active employee engagement opportunities. We have community outreach opportunities uh, that we work with uh, the various uh, locations. Uh, in terms of job base, you have mentorship pro programs. So when someone comes on board, you're working with folks that have expertise in a skill set either on the assembly line, in the engineering or software areas, in the certification of the product. And that mentorship is allowing them to grow at a faster rate because of that learning process where they have practical applications coming from the uh, academic world, from their apprentice world, into internship, into a job, and then continues with mentorship and engagement. So you have to have a culture that is constantly learning and recognizing that that learning process is critical to the success of your existing employee base and for the future growth of the company. Yeah, so aside from the, the culture, because you guys are great at, at fostering that, that mentorship and that connection and bridging that gap, but a lot of companies and organizations have troubles with the communication aspect. You know, we hear about um, you know, the, all the negative connotations we hear about millennials, right? Sure. How are you guys, what strategies are you putting in place to ensure okay. that there's a healthy communication stream as, as our marketplace and our digital world continues to evolve. Yeah, so it's great. So we, uh, with, uh, under Embraer X and a lot of what we do inside the company is look for digital solutions to what something might have been done uh, in prior uh, structure and breaking down some of the barriers of communication. Uh, so transparency uh, of data, transparency of communication is a critical part. We have uh, lots of uh, online capabilities in terms of helpline, in terms of uh, blogs in terms of My Embraer sites, Fly Embraer sites for both our customers, portals as well as our employee portals. So there's a, a network that's been built up for various facets of communication that takes place across the entire company. And that interface is fed into each of the business units as well as in our global HR department so that we're actually, actually acting on that communication. And so the sort of the voice of the customer uh, is easy to, to talk to, but also the voice of the employee and uh, taking action upon what that uh, input is uh, has been very, very meaningful. Yeah, I, li I like the two-way communication where you're, you're drawing that feedback back into. And, and Suzanne, from being on the academic side, ag again, um, as students, again, technology, the infusion of, of, of tablets and everything else in the classroom, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you see evolve as, as the classroom perspective as you instructing and teaching? How's that changing? Yeah, so um, everything we know about what good teaching is, it's kind of intuitive, right? Like if, if anybody thinks of the best teacher they've had, the best learning experience they've had, it probably wasn't a professor standing at the front of the room reading this text off of the slides in a slow monotone voice. It was probably engaging. It caused you to reflect, to think on your past experiences and apply new knowledge. So technology can be a tool that helps us do that. So we want to create what we call learner-centered instruction. And what that means is that I'm not teaching you in the way I learned, which may be boring and outdated and arguing with you and saying, well, I learned it this way. You should be able to learn it this way too. I'm actually trying to figure out what you understand and how I can chart a course for you to create that competency. So, so find your pathway there. So there's a lot of tools. Uh, in my classroom, I actually use uh, e-learning software ca called Articulate, which allows me to do all sorts of interactive quizzes and cases in the classroom. Uh, that's a little, there's a bit of a learning curve to learn that software. But one thing I would recommend, anybody who does classroom teaching, uh, there is a software tool called Kahoot, uh, K-A-H-O-O-T. 
totally free. It's uh, you can build quizzes, and um, in my it's free to use. Students use their phones or tablets, and when I lecture, every 10 to 15 minutes, I'll put a quiz uh, into my lectures. So uh, even if it's just one teacher and 100 students, uh, there's still some reflection. It's forcing them to sort of stop consider how this new knowledge links into what's already in their long-term memory, uh, process it, and respond to it. And there's a lot of research that suggests that that type of engagement improves learning and retention. Um, I also give them prizes, so there's some like extrinsic motivation. Uh, so it makes, it makes it a lot more fun. Uh, that being said, there is a tremendous amount of research about the negative impacts of technology in classrooms as well. Uh, this is not going to be a shock to any of you, and certainly none of you, but like other people uh, are often distracted by their technology. I know it's surprising to hear that, but um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, I call them weapons of mass distraction. Laptops in a classroom actually significantly degrade a person's learning. And not only that, but research suggests that anybody who is in view of their laptop, that it actually hurts their learning worse than the person using the laptop. And probably all of you have had that experience where somebody in front of you has uh, a laptop open. And I always laugh when I'm teaching because I'm like, there's no way I'm that entertaining. Because you can see like a, a you know, semi-circle of people laughing in one corner. And you're thinking like, yeah, there's something else going on on that laptop. Um, and so the research suggests that old school handwriting notes is actually uh, promotes the best learning and retention in a classroom setting. And they suggest that the reason for that is because you can't type as fast as the person is talking. So it forces you to stop, reflect in your own words, and then write down notes that have been through a second round of processing internally. Uh, so technology, I think, can be a really good thing to engage in. Maybe we're going to see some of that in a minute with the Q&A here. Um, but it can also have really negative impacts as well. So it's sort of like it completely depends on the application and purpose. Absolutely, and that's really fascinating. And, and that interactive portion, obviously, you alluded to greatly in, in giving prizes. So <laughs> we, have, we have a couple books here from Suzanne. Um, and and then via the app, there's some questions available because we can sit up here and probably discuss this at nauseum all day long, but we obviously want to get some feedback from the audience here. Um, so Tyler, I think, has been monitoring the app and will also field some questions from the audience. And, and again, as a, a bonus for participating, we have a couple signed copies of the books here from, from Suzanne. So they're, they're not signed yet, but I will They sign will them. sign, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, I've, I've been looking at some questions that have come in. And, and Suzanne actually touched on a little bit of one of the questions um, already. And it was, how are you implementing evidence-based training in the classroom today? Mm -hmm. And I think you've kind of really hit on a lot of that um, by you know, really adapting to focus on the, the weak areas and not really just the total total hours. But can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, so th that's a great question because it's, it's hard, right? Like if you're teaching somebody in a scenario-based fashion in a simulator or an aircraft, that makes sense, right? Like you know what the mission is and it's easy to work towards that mission. In a classroom, you think, well, we've all sat in classrooms and it's just kind of going over the material on slides over and over again. So how do I make that practice space or case space. So um, there's a lot of educational strategies you can use in your teaching. Uh, one of them is whole task training. And what that means is that even right from the very beginning, when you're learning a new material, you're presented a problem. And then the students are given time to seek out the answers to that problem. Uh, we, we call it a flipped classroom model because this requires students to prepare in advance. So a lot of that like basic rote memory reading kind of stuff you do before you get to the classroom. And then the classroom is used for things that are actually benefited by having a human instructor in the front of the room. And I laugh because how often do we have like an expert world-class instructor at the front of the room reading slides? Like we can all read, we don't need that <laughs> expertise uh, to read the slides. But if we're using them to guide us through thinking and to mimic for us how we solve problems, how we apply and draw and information together, that's where you can create a classroom that benefits from this evidence-based or competency-based metric. There's a lot of really neat uh, technology solutions as well, where there's like, you know, classroom um, sort of um, desktop simulator kind of things or, where you, you're in problems work in groups. Those are great, but you can also just give the students a problem and, and have them work through it. So it's sort of like, uh, we call it a switch from the sage on the stage, so like the lecturer or the teacher being at the front you know, on the stage, versus a guide on the side. So you're, you're helping, you're supporting, you're leading the students towards learning, but ultimately learning is an individual process that you're trying to help facilitate for each person. Great. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And um, uh, Michael, how does uh, Embraer develop all their young talent into their future leaders? Um, so can you elaborate on sure. that a little bit? Uh, happy to uh, highlight that. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's that you have to start early in the process. And we have uh, a lot of talent management uh, folks on our uh, global H uh, HR department that's working with trying to attract people. And so we work with the UCF 
FIT, Embry Riddle, uh, Florida Eastern, uh, all the c colleges, and have their their programs. So you first have to have to get the right talent to come into the organization, and then once you have the right talent, you have to associate them with uh, the opportunities that are going to best serve their their path towards their uh, career development. And as I mentioned earlier, we talked about this mentorship process. And so we develop talent by taking an approach that says that there's individuals that have roles and responsibilities that are very specific. Someone's making something that's on part of an airplane and the skill sets required to do that. But then, then how do you grow that in terms of management of quality for safety and reliability of your product for your customers? And what are the skill sets that go into that? How do you develop a manager or a supervisor where they're going to now start to manage people, not just a functional area of responsibility? And part of that comes from taking ownership. So instead of just uh, do a task, get paid, it's take ownership in the project. So just like you, we launched two new products. Well, there's a whole programs team and an engineering team and a design team, and that um, comes together as a project and so when it finally comes together and you announce the product, everyone involved takes ownership in it. And so you have to have more of a groundswell kind of feeling around some of these programs and products that you have within your organization. Uh, align them with uh, good partners and mentors and leaders in the organization. We do a lot of cross-functional responsibilities. So someone might be in commercial aviation progresses for some ranks, and then we move them over to defense or to executive and likewise from the other sectors. So that cross-functional responsibility is another way to grow future leaders because they have a broader view of products and customers and challenges uh, that are there. One of our um, uh, folks that uh, does something in our organization oftentimes is, is uh, met with challenge after challenge. And so that experience, that lens that you have from the challenges that you accomplish gives you the outreach to be able to uh, uh, provide that to another part of the business. So we do a lot of cross-pollination within the various business units and that allows us to have management level roles and senior level engineers and, uh, and eventually leaders within the organization that have a very broad view uh, of how to be successful as a leader, as a manager of people, and as a company. Uh, real quick, I, I, there's something you mentioned there about finding the right people for Correct. the job, and that's why you're, you're cross-pollinating trading. But even before finding the right people again, are, are there challenges or struggles you're facing even finding the people to put them through the vetting process to get to the yeah, so right it's, candidate. It's, it's only uh, difficult because of how competitive it is. So uh, just in the case of Brevard County, it's 3% uh, you know, uh, unemployment, so it's very, very low. You have you know, thousands of companies that are in the aerospace and aviation sector that are just a short mileage away from each other from the Space Coast and Cape Canaveral and NASA uh, down through to Miami. So there's a high demand of, of that talent. So you have to do this outreach that I mentioned to really do the screening process. Uh, we do have programs that bring people on board where they are doing internships so that we can test that uh, opportunity, Chris, and make sure that the right skill sets are aligned with the right roles. Um, so it's, um, and we work very closely with, uh, like I mentioned, the Ember Riddles of the world. So you're, you're looking for them to help us grow talent that are needed for roles. So we pr provide them, here are the job opportunities that we have in our company so that they can help grow those individuals coming out of the, the, the uh, curriculum and then they're perfectly matched for us. Now we just have to compete with the other companies <laughs> that, are, that, uh, that they come hire, we hire them before someone else does. Yeah, and, and that competition, not only within our own industry, and maybe you can, you can elaborate more on like the, um, the educational institutional side. Again, we, we're, we're very dependent again on those schools and those programs. Uh, but with everything else going on in the world vying for attention, how are, are, are schools, do you see a, a significant amount or a sufficient amount, I'm sorry, of interest coming into our space from the educational side where we can funnel them down the road to programs like Michael have? Uh, yes and no. So uh, I, I feel like I have the luckiest job at the university because 
uh, the aviation students that I teach, they're in a very expensive program, which means that they are passionate about, about what they're there for, so they already love aviation. But I always think that for every person in my class who loves aviation, how many of them are there who couldn't afford it or couldn't find a path forward? And then beyond that, how many were maybe interested but didn't have access to enough information? Or they didn't think it was viable to get into? Uh, and I'll tell you just a quick story. So when I first started attending ICAO and um, sort of being in this international environment, what became really clear to me quickly was that one of the first questions people ask is kind of like, what team are you on? And, and what they mean, like, are you business aviation or commercial aviation? Are you an ATC or an airport person? Are you maintenance or dispatchers? And there, we have this industry. I have a label. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And everybody kind of like, right away, like, who are you? Like, are you on my team or are you on a different team? And, um, and what that really sort of resonated with me was the idea that in most aviation uh, pilot programs, we only have a success rate of about 50%. So only half of these young students who come in and start training for whether it's aptitude or financial or what other reason are actually successful and enter the workforce as a pilot. And what bugs me is that these people, we probably had multiple touch points with them in their youth, like maybe, maybe they went to an air show or you know, they had a presentation in their class or whatever. There's all these touch points that eventually led them up to decide, I want to be a pilot. All of that you know, work invested and yet um, something happens and very often when they don't succeed as a pilot, they leave aviation entirely. And what I found is that a lot of the time they don't realize what other opportunities there are besides flying. And I feel like that is one of the biggest challenges of having an industry that is so siloed. And that's fundamentally um, the, the book that, that we we're going to give away. That's where the book came from, is that I wanted to take the, the entire training sector for the industry, which I think is like narrow. You focus on being a pilot in one Canada, or like in Canada, as an example. But then as you progress in your career, you start to learn about not only uh, how other professionals in aviation function, but also how your job is different in other countries. And I thought, well, what if we flip that upside down? What if we start with the most broad introduction to all of the different sectors and professional groups in aviation so that young people who are passionate, that they can choose the role that best aligns with their interests and ambitions. And my goal with that was just for a retention purpose. But, so we want to keep people. We want to make sure that everybody who's, who's in those classrooms, that maybe you don't end up as a pilot, but maybe there's another role that you've discovered that you're passionate about where you can contribute to the industry. I think there was a day when aviation could sort of relax and say, you know, if you can't fit in the industry we've created, you know, no, don't let the door hit you on the way out because we have 100 people lined up outside to take your spot. I don't think that's the case anymore, particularly not on an international scale, that we need to be creative and we need to give them the information so that we're promoting uh, the best position for each person that aligns with what they want in a career. It's interesting, Chris, uh, Suzanne's uh, point out about this concept of retention. So on one hand, you, you, our earlier comments about apprenticeships and internships and working with the collegiate schools to bring people into the organization, but it's just as important to try to develop programs that retain your people. And Pilots is a great example of that. AMP Mechanics is another great example of that. Technicians, we have to do things that are gonna allow folks to stay at the company. Um, and that means you have to invest in something that has a career path opportunity. So not only the cross-functional comments I made, but how do you retain a pilot? How do you retain an AMP mechanic? And giving them the opportunity to work on different types of aircraft is a pretty cool thing. So instead of being just focused on today, you're working on a commercial uh, E-Jet, well, maybe tomorrow you're working on the KC-390 for the military, or you're working on an executive jet like the Praetor 600 that just got launched. Right? or you're working on a digital platform that's coming out of Embraer X, and you heard this morning from Eric Ooster regarding Embra uh, Uber Elevate and Embraer's role in helping to come to market with the product that allows that uh, to happen. So there's so many opportunities for folks to be wanted, be retained by a company because you have various jobs and responsibilities for those that have talent. And I'd be remiss if I didn't comment about, we have phenomenal um, breadth of knowledge in Brazil. And it's important for you to recognize that it all started with the engineers and the folks that came from Brazil and were mindful enough to come to this great sta uh, state in Florida and in America to bring all of the products to the, to the United States. Um, but that talent, that skill set started from Brazil. And are, now we're looking at ways in which we can um, do um, populating back, if you will, that knowledge with the Embraer Foundation and Institute. So it, you have to grow and you have to retain, and you have to really work hard at keeping people uh, interested in your product and in your brand, um, and uh, it's really exciting to be a part of it. Yeah. 
Do we have any other questions from the audience, or do you, we can continue our dialogue? <laughs> we, we do. We do. We've got uh, tons of questions. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think after we answer some of these coming that came in through the app, we're going to open it up to everyone in the in the room because obviously all of these are anonymous, and we need some books to give away. Um, <laughs> so we've talked about mentorship. We've talked about uh, a little bit about internships. Um, and I, this one's for Michael. Um, what does Embraer's, uh, if you do, do you have internship programs? Um, there's a lot of people that have posted in here. How do you, how do the selection process? Sure. Um, yeah, so I can talk about it in a little bit of a framework and uh, try to, Matt, Maggie Loriano's in the audience. She'll be happy to answer some specific questions from geographies that she'll have more familiarity with. But in general, we, we have mostly summer programs that will feed into a fall cycle, trying to take advantage of opportunities where, you know, the folks are out of school and do some things during the summer programs. Uh, uh, we do have a very robust talent uh, management team, so they're actively engaged with uh, the colleges and universities that are both in aeronautics, uh, in aerospace, in defense, in software, in systems, and looking for that talent, and then aligning that with the job roles and responsibilities where we would have uh, opportunities during those, that, that period. Um, and also, you look at it during peak time. So, um, very like in our business, that's the fourth quarter of the year. It's very much peak time. So you're drawing talent in where you where you need it to to uh, bolster incremental uh, needs within the organization. So, good opportunities to associate with the various universities. Those universities are aligned with our talent management team. Talent management team allows for uh, alignment of uh, the job opportunities that exist. They come on board for a period of time. That period of time might be of the five or six or eight weeks that the summer would be. And some continue longer term uh, into the program of the apprenticeship. Great. And I think that this one really um, hits to our point about the session. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that say, you know, I can't get access to my local airport. You know, I don't know how to break in and, mm -hmm. and really either get that first flight or even get a tour of the FBO or the local operator. Um, you know, what, what do you see, um, both Michael and Suzanne and, and even Chris, um, you know, for, uh, for operators that can actually work with those, those students or students just to be able to walk in and, and, and have that conversation? It's a, it's a pretty challenging thing and I think, you know, um, how can we make the general aviation a little bit more accessible? Well, I think, you know, one of the challenges in our industry now is when I talk to my generation, almost everybody who loves aviation had an experience as a kid where they were invited up to the cockpit in the middle of the flight and they were, uh, you know, asked to look around and the, the pilot said hello to them. But that was a really sort of a shared common experience that motivated a lot of people to, to love aviation. And of course now with the, the reinforced cockpit doors, the next generation doesn't get that exposure. And I often kind of lament that, you know, the fact that most aviation occurs behind big fences at airports, I think it creates this public perception that it's separate, you know, that it's not welcoming, that it, it's not something that you're welcome to engage with. That being said, I think there are, is tremendous efforts throughout the industry. Uh, a lot of people willing to uh, air shows and girls can fly days and, and uh, all sorts of sort of open door opportunities like the many initiatives that you're offering, that, that I feel the industry is trying to open those doors and to capitalize on it. Uh, a lot of what we do with ICAO's NGAP program is just trying to like highlight good examples of some of those practices. I know in, in Singapore, for example, they have um, a bus that they've outfitted and, and all the different sections of the bus are profiling different aviation careers. There's like a dispatch and maintenance and pilot section of the bus and they just drive it around all the schools and all the school children go through the bus and, and, and get that exposure. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of really neat things happening. I think a challenge is that uh, there's a lot of duplication of the efforts that are being made, that there isn't the really one good way to sort of bring all of that together where we can find all of those resources. I know even in my teaching, I have my students build curriculums for for teachers and then we make those available. So if there's a grade five or grade six teacher and they, they need a little piece of aviation curriculum, it's there, but we don't have a way to let them know necessarily that it's there unless they're looking for it. So, so I think that the reality is there's a lot of passionate people in aviation. I think we're the best advocates for our own industry because most of us didn't just happen to it by accident. Most of us care about it and, and enjoy what we're doing. And so it's just about trying to figure out how to um, get that message out to the next generation all the way down to, to the little kids and encourage them to capitalize on the outreach activities that already exist. Very good. Great. Um, 
So uh, I think it's a good time to, to give some books out unless we have some more questions for the panel. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I'd say let's open it up to, to the audience and, and lose that anonymity so we can give some prizes away. Exactly. Well, we've got a question over there, so let me run over. Hi, my name is Zachary Leibowitz. First of all, thank you for speaking about this. This is something I care about as well. My question is, considering how much it costs to attend this amazing event, is it possible for maybe to come up with a solution that involves exhibitors sponsoring young people to come? Well, that's an interesting opportunity. I'm, um, I would say, why not, in, in one hand, right? I mean, we're always looking for those opportunities. I don't think we have an actual program that does sponsorship at that uh, individual level, but it's definitely something that uh, will prompt an action step on my part to try to see how we can explore that. Um, we do do sponsorships, we do do uh, grants, and we do those things that are very much associated with the schools I had mentioned, but as relates to s like shows like this that are across the globe, that's not something that we've invested in, but that's something we can eventually evaluate. Awesome. Thank you for that. Hi, my name is Rachel Stanley. I'm from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona. So my question to you guys, you guys talked about bringing in a younger generation. And so kind of in our day and age now, social media platforms are huge. How do you see yourself right now kind of utilizing that and kind of this generation, what you guys can bring forward with those social media platforms? Well, that's a fantastic question. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and then you can. Yeah. So, um, well, right now, I'm just as an example, my LinkedIn is blowing up once you put a new product out there right now. So uh, with uh, the launch, we, we use a lot of social media platforms. So Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, it's, it's very much about engagement with our young community. Um, and that's a, a process that we take very seriously. Uh, we use it as an opportunity not only to communicate what's, what we're doing as an organization with new products and services, but also as a conduit to look for opportunities for employment and for, with young people. So that's an active part of what we do. We also have an internal site that's uh, blue, so that's picture the same concept internally. So our, our blue platform internally allows for blogging, and allows for communication of the thousands of people that are already part of the Embraer family. So, and they have their own communication network within those social media platforms. So it sort of starts to work together. So that's a little bit of what we do. Uh, I just want to just quickly touch on that. I think that it just when you mentioned that, it made me think of another huge issue with recruitment and aviation is that we only have globally the commercial pilot population about 5% women. Uh, ICAO did set an initiative, they call it 50-50 by 2040, like we get 50-50. Um, whether that's possible or yeah. not, like obviously that's a tremendous challenge. There's a huge gap between where we are and what that would be. But I see some tremendous examples of women leaders in aviation using social media to capitalize on the idea that you can be feminine and still succeed as a professional in the industry. And I think that there's a lot of value and power in using that platform for that purpose because uh, for the, all those young girls out there, if you can't look to somebody who looks like you, uh, you may feel like that door is closed. And so I think that, um, I don't know, you see, when I, when I was going through uh, every riddle, um, they told us, you know, if you go for an interview, you wear a black suit, hair back, no makeup. And it, and it was almost like this, um, reinforcement of this sort of masculinizing process. Um, and I don't think it was intended in any negative way. It was, it was the expectation of the industry. You're trying to conform with the culture of the industry. And I think that there's truth that that's probably going to allow you to be more successful in the interview process. But that being said, it also has a subconscious effect of saying, because you're a woman, um, you don't quite fit, right? Like this, is, this isn't um, generally the exact place where, where you may end up. So, so I think social media can be a really good way of showing that you can be a woman and, and still be a leader in the field. Yeah, and, and I think, um, I guess from my perspective, is that w everything online is, is social now. Everything from not only just the platforms themselves, but, but from Amazon to Netflix to Hulu, every, everything is social. And it's not enough anymore to just get by on social. We've really got to thrive, especially with the competitive landscape that we're facing. It, it, it's really thriving um, and delivering customized and personalized messaging to, to our segmented audiences. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, Michael, you mentioned last year in a conference about that impact of millennials and delivering that customization. So I, I, again, we're aware of it, and I think we're, we're evolving and we're adapting. 
Um, it's just how fast will we, will we get there to get ahead of the curve instead of being reactive. Anyway, you can have a, like a voice of customer, so get hearing the input. So these channels, right, uh, as we call them, whether it be social channels or whether webinars that Chris puts on, you know, gives you an opportunity to have engagement. So you have to continue that in the workplace. So we have breakfast chats with Michael. So picture the concept of having a CEO sit down with a group of employees and have real conversations. So it's not a report, it's not a project, it's not a task. It's let's just talk, what's going on, how can we help you? What are the things we need to do to improve uh, the in cultural environment of the, of the workplace? How do you succeed on the goals of the action plan uh, of a particular uh, area of functional responsibility? That comes from conversation. And these social channels are just another way of communicating, right? So you have to do it on the front end, but you also have to live it in your workplace. Great, great comments and thoughts. Um, any additional questions for our panelists? Hi, my name is Nick, and I'm also from Embry-Riddle Prescott. Um, I'm a global business and supply chain major. I'm curious about what kind of unique challenges your supply chain has and how you could see young people helping you with the unique problems that you have. That's a great question, and it's uh, very appropriate because uh, we're at uh, a very competitive landscape when it comes to consolidation that's taking place in the sector. So when you have suppliers that are buying other suppliers, merging those products and services, then it becomes that much more uh, in needing to be ahead of it. And I think the answer is digital. I mean, you, we have to start to look for solutions that come from software solutions and digital solutions that transform how we do things. We have to also look at vertical integration. Um, so just as an example, we vertically integrate our seats. So that gives us an opportunity to bring te technology in-house um, so that you can manage your supply chain uh, appropriately. So some things you look to and you, you purchase from a third party, some things you make yourself, and some things you choose to vertically integrate a combination of collaborating with your partners in supply chain. So ideas, I think you'd want to focus much more on digital transformation ideas that allows for efficiencies, that allows for costs to come down, reliability to go up, quality to be maintained, safety to be maintained. That's what we have to make sure we have when it comes to an airplane is the safety and reliability of, of the product. So it's important for us to look for more advanced solutions than the traditional path. And then it's collaborating with our partners from the entire value stream. No, that's, that's great, Michael. We had some really, really great questions um, today. If you've got any other questions, um, Michael, is there a place people could find you online? Or Suzanne, yes. would you be willing My to offer My LinkedIn up? is, uh, just check it out on LinkedIn. That's the first place you can go. Obviously on Embraer as well. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn as well. It's the best way to get a hold of me. Awesome. Well, I, I hope you guys got some tremendous value out of today. I really appreciate you guys' time. And Thanks, Tyler, Chris. I think we're, we're done. Yeah, Thanks, so um, thank you all for really engaging in this session. Um, it's an important, important topic. Um, it's obviously not, uh, not going away. The, in, the industry is going to continue to get younger. We hope you all continue to uh, participate in these events. Um, and Offland has uh, offered, uh, they've videoed the session. They've also taken down a lot of uh, notes. So if you text uh, Offland to 4222, um, they will make sure to send everything over to you. Uh, keep the conversation going, keep the networking going, uh, and actually it's a perfect time because we have the NBA Coffee Social right next door in the NBA booth. So and again, thank you. Please come see our airplanes. We're at Static 42 out at Static, yes. and we're here at 5030. Come by and uh, happy to continue the conversations with our team. Please, thank please you. do. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. Nice job. Thanks. Thanks.